the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Some 50 years ago, composer Leonard Bernstein broke all sorts of musical conventions with his groundbreaking work, Mass. He combined theater with dance, with classical music, with rock music, with a quadrophonic sound system. Remember those? <laughs> Using the overall structure of a Roman Catholic mass, he sought to break religion out of that very institution's form and make it more every day. According to interviews, he wanted to knock people off balance. He wanted them to feel. Mass started in its existence very slowly, but it has hung on for the last 50 years. Minus some of its features, it was even performed in the Vatican as part of the Jubilee year in 2000. The underlying story of Mass is a crisis being suffered by the main character, the celebrant. It is a personal crisis of faith and vocation made more real by the turmoil of the world around him. At the climax, in the midst of an emotional breakdown, he hurls the glass chalice to the floor where it breaks. The celebrant then muses over how easily things get broken. He was broken. His institutional religion was broken. What was to become of either? Some 505 years ago, Augustinian monk Martin Luther also broke convention with his nailing of 95 theses to the door of Wittenberg Castle Church. His critique and call to debate on the selling of indulgences, sort of a get out of hell free card, turned into more than simply a break with convention. Luther's action and subsequent refusal to recant his position led to a breaking apart of the church, an action of which we are all heirs, and which we mark today. Reformation implies brokenness. We are talking, of course, about reformation, and it is more a part of our heritage than just Luther's actions of some 500 years ago. It was at the heart of our formation as Christians 2,000 years ago. Jesus was not the first reformer. There were prophets before him, but most scholars would agree that he was not out to start a new religion, but rather to reform Judaism. To do that meant breaking some rules, shattering some conventions. Even the little interchange we heard from John's gospel reflects the conflict. Jesus questions the assumption that a physical tie to Abraham makes one free. Institutions or lineage do not provide freedom, he says, but rather a relationship to the truth, which he embodied, a religion of the heart, not of legal observance. Of course, Jesus' initial band of followers grew, and as such groups inevitably do, this one took on structure and developed conventions. Churches in one part of the Mediterranean differed in belief and practice from those in other parts. Christians understood their localized forms of the faith to be the true faith. And the ensuing crisis, culminating in the sacking of Constantinople during the Crusades, broke the ecumenical church asunder. It was a break, even now, a millennium later, that is only beginning to be healed. Whether this break institutes a reformation remains to be seen. Who will you, whose heart will soften? Luther's actions precipitated much. Not only did that portion of the church under his influence reform, but others found the courage to dissent. Calvin in Zurich, the Anabaptists along the Rhine, in a slightly different way. At least at the start, the Church of England, too, was a part of the process, although we must remember that Henry VIII was given his title of Defender of the Faith for his early stance against Luther. 
Indeed, that Catholic Church itself undertook some admittedly reactionary reforms. The battery on the Wittenberg door was an action that spawned something much larger. <clears throat> like the celebrant in mass, looking at the broken chalice and spilled wine and wondering what next. <clears throat> in all of these reformations of the church, there was some trepidation about the future. Brokenness always holds that feature. Whether it's the breaking of a favorite moment, the breaking of a relationship, or the breaking of an institution, we wonder how we will go on, what will emerge from the pain. Does the broken heart, whether an institutional heart or an, indi or an individual heart, harden or change? In Jeremiah's world, God recognized a hard heart, a heart of religion that had become as calcified as the stone tablet upon which the law was written. God called the people to task and promised a new covenant, one that would not be written on stone, but that would be written on the heart itself, as if that action would break through the institutional crust, keeping the relationship between God and God's people from blossoming and bearing its full fruit. The promise, implicit in, God's in Jeremiah's prophecy, has never been completely and fully realized. What may have been temporarily changed heart simply hardened again as time went on. Jesus was addressing folks who had come to believe in him. These were not his opponents when he said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Their hearts were in the process of becoming changed, of being reformed. When this perceived challenge to the privilege of the children of Abraham threw that into doubt. Indeed, in the rest of Jesus' conversation with these new believers, the challenge becomes so great that their hearts re hardened rather than accepting the truth. The episode ends with them picking up stones to throw at Jesus. We are no different than any of these forebears. When the opportunity for reformation draws near us, how do we respond? When we as individuals have cherished beliefs challenged and perhaps broken, do we harden our resolve and deny the truth? Is this not a little more than a lapse into a form of fundamentalism? Or do we emerge from the experience renewed and strong, different, yes, but renewed and stronger? If Jesus was right, that knowing the truth brings freedom. And if history and experience show that our tendency is towards hardened institutions, then maybe the real question is whether or not we really want the truth. Can we handle it? Can we handle him? That is Jesus. What in our heart of hearts do we want him to reform? but are afraid to give him access to. I believe that most of us can and that most of us want the truth. If we didn't, we probably wouldn't be here on Reformation Sunday. But isn't every Sunday Reformation Sunday? And maybe that's the point, that Reformation isn't a once-for-all thing. Whether with an institution such as the church or with <clears throat> Individuals, we are called to constant con conversion, continual reformation. The celebrant in mass literally and figuratively picks up the pieces at the end of the composition, surrounded by a supportive uh, community. His life, his heart, his religion was changed through the experience of being broken. For me, as a participant in the piece, where I participate every time I hear or watch it. I sense the possibility of my own heart being broken and remade each time. The possibility is there continually, even though the recorded performance was a one-time event. 
I began this morning referring to a Jewish composer's use of the Roman Catholic Mass. I'm here on the 505th anniversary of the action that it eventuated in the Lutheran Church. So now as a nod to our Anglican Episcopal Reformation, I'd like to close with one of my favorite poems. Its author was born in to the Roman Catholic Church, but conformed to the established church in England. After a career in civil service, he was ordained a priest and was regarded as the best known preacher in the Church of England. John Donne obviously knew of reformation. Battle my heart, three persons God. For you as yet, but not breathe, shine, and seek to mend, that I may rise and stand or throw me and bend your force to break, blow, burn, and make me new. I, like a usurped town to another do, labor to admit you, but oh, to no end. Reason your viceroy in me, me should defend, but is captive and proves weak or untrue. Yet dearly I love you and would be loved, fain, but am betrothed unto your enemy. Divorce me, untie or break that knot again. Take me to you, imprison me, for I accept you, enthrall me, never shall be free nor ever chased, except you ravish me. <laughs>